No? So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this session. <coughs> if I can have this thing working. <laughs> yeah. Just a few words to introduce the, the way we are going to work. Uh, the duration, as you have, for those who have looked at the program, the duration is about one hour and 45 minutes. There should be 40 minutes. I have to introduce all the members of the panel, plus a panel discussion. They will talk during eight, nine minutes each to present what they are doing and to answer a few questions. I will go back to the question after that. Then there will be 45 minutes of table discussion. We have prepared with the panel, since we are serious people, we have prepared a few questions. You can add other questions, no problem with that. But And I have made copies of the questions, but I'll give them to you later on because you have to listen first to the panelists. And then there will be the, the, the feedback discussion. Uh, so I am the moderator, uh, Jean-Marie Flo. Uh, the panelists are Jan, alors, sorry if I don't pronounce the name properly, Van Aberke. Berke from EMBRC, Juanro Daniel Beita, ah, that's not too bad, from EMSO, uh, Maria, uh, Margarita Capaletto from the Blue Economy System, and Roberta, because uh, I, I was supposed to have Andreas uh, Straskinescu, and now you have, we have Roberta. Roberta Zobbi, good afternoon, from Digimare. From Digimare. So, the panelists, they will have to, to answer the three general, present what they are doing, plus answer the three general questions. What are the needs and opportunities for engagement of ARIs with stakeholders and major EU initiatives? What can ARIs offer now and in the future? <coughs> and how can collaboration be optimized? So uh, let me check. No, OK. So I will say a few words about all the panelists. Juan Ro is the general director of EMSO. Eric, European Air Research Infrastructure, and the, the infrastructure is dedicated to promoting, to promote multidisciplinary research in deep waters and water columns with special emphasis on global change, marine biodiversity, and geohazard around the European seas. He has, well, he has more than 40 years of experience in marine research and technology with more, more than 100 scientific papers. Congratulations. Uh, he has managed, uh, during his career, he has managed numerous national, European, and international marine research projects. Uh, he will give you more detail later on. What I would like to add is that he was awarded the Orden of the Isabel La Catolica for his contribution in Antarctic research in, in January 2010, and the Orden Merito Civil in 2015, uh, sorry, for his exceptional contribution to the state in marine and polar science and given by the King Philip VI, <coughs> right? No, I don't make any mistake. So, <laughs> Margarita, uh, Margarita is a technologist at the Department of Earth Science and Environmental Technology for the National Research Council of Italy. She has a background in astronomy and astrophysics and a master in science communication. She works at the interface of science and policy, including international cooperation, networking programs, and project development target, targeting uh, marine and marine science. Since 2014, she has been supporting the intergovernmental era initiative Blue Med for Blue Jobs and Growth in the Mediterranean Sea, joined by 16 countries. More recently, from 2016 to 2021, she was the project manager of the EU-funded project Blue Med Coordination and Support Action. Recently, she has been supporting the Italian Oceanographic Commission in developing Science Meet, the Mediterranean program for the decade of ocean science for sustainable development, and joined the team at the Italian Ministry of, of University and Research of Italy, coordinating the, sustainable, the sorry, sustainable Blue Economic Partnership with 25 EU members. Uh, I jump to, because I have the, the VT of Andrea, but not of Roberta, so but, uh, <laughs> I, I jump to Jan. Uh, he's, a marine, he's a marine ecologist with a wide experience in marine ecology. He had position at Ghent University, the Center of Estuarine and Marine Ecology, currently NIOZ, the Netherlands. Yeah, I know the project. And the University of Oldenburg, Germany. <coughs> 
it, it took a position of senior scientist at the Royal Belgium Institute of Natural Science and is serving as visiting professor at Ghent University. His, re, his early research activity included working in deep sea and polar area before mainly focusing on the ecology of the North Sea ecosystem. He's the author of about 92 peer review publications, 11 book chapters, and many and numerous reports. I'm not sure the reports are the more important thing in the story, but. <laughs> <laughs> he was a member of the group of experts for the first World Ocean Assessment and is currently chairing the ICS Working Group on Marine Benta Renewable Energy Development. He was responsible for the implementation of the Belgian contribution to the European Marine Biological Resources Center and involved in EMBRC ERIC since the priority phase. He's currently acting as the vice chair of the Committee of the Nodes of the EMBRC. Roberta, I'm sorry, but I cannot talk for you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and apologies from Andrea. She's sick at home. It was not foreseen, so she would have preferred to be here today. Uh, I'm here on her behalf. I'm in Digimare. Why Digimare is here? Because we are responsible for Mission Ocean and Waters. Uh, we are uh, the mission manager, and uh, we work together with DGRTD, uh, who is mission, uh, deputy mission manager for the implementation of the mission. In Digimare, uh, in my unit, we are not only responsible for uh, Mission Ocean, we also take care of ocean observation. We are in charge of a number of initiatives linked to ocean literacy, uh, and uh, uh, we also <laughs> are responsible for um, for uh, Emotnet, so you might have heard about uh, about Emotnet. So I think this is it. Thank you very much. So now uh, each panelist will say a few words, introduce himself and what he is doing, with about eight to ten minutes, no more than that, because then we have to continue and answer the three questions I, I have give, I have shown to you before. So I hope you like to start. So thank you very much, uh, Jean Marie. Yeah, I mean, you have to speak there because everything is re is recorded. You are not aware of that, but Everything is recorded. It, no, if everybody accepts this in the song, which is important. Well, thank you very much, Jean-Marie. It is a pleasure to be here. Uh, well, the paradox is that the, this uh, parallel session is called the ocean, and I look like we are in a little lake because we are not so many. But it doesn't matter. I think we, we can progress in whatever case. Well, I'm happy to uh, report a little bit about what I'm so Eric is doing. So... EMSO, Eric is, um, uh, EMSO is a European multidisciplinary seafloor and water column observatory, so we cover the whole ocean from the surface to the subsea floor. And I try to name this uh, presentation a Strength Collaboration in Ocean Observation to Preserve the Ocean Health and Resources. I think without collaboration, it is very complicated in the ocean to do anything, even if in a small ocean basin like is the Mediterranean, according to the to the status of the big ocean. We don't have even an ocean in the Mediterranean. Well, the EMSO Arctic Green Facilities component uh, from 2021 is we are distributed uh, research infrastructure all over the European seas from the Nordic Sea, which is the gate to the Arctic across the, um, the North Atlantic, entering into the Mediterranean basin up to the Black Sea, which is an interesting close uh, ocean. Well, in terms of the number of uh, research in, uh, countries, uh, we have nine countries covering by 28 research infrastructure. We have 15 uh, fixed point multi sensor platforms, 12 of them, they are deep sea observatories, cable and standalone, and three of them, they are test site for shallow water testing. I think we thought that this is much more cheaper if you test uh, whatever you want to deploy at 3,000 meters initially at the shallow water, you save a lot of money and time, and it's very useful. I mean, the aim is observing and monitoring the ocean, and by uh, continuous recording of essential ocean variables in, in time series, and the target is an uh, open ocean multidisciplinary to understand what are the interaction between the geosphere, hydrosphere, biosphere, and atmosphere. Well, the mission in Emsoatic is to establish a comprehensive and smart sensor system, not only in the water column, but also the seafloor and at the subsea floor. 
And the reason of that is because many of the things that we are looking at the surface of the oceans they are happening already at the bottom. We don't know much about this. And indeed, every time we send a sensor there, a rope, we discover a new species or a new process that's happening there. So this is one of the things we should uh, enhance by doing this, uh, enhance this community. Uh, we are an integrated and distributed organization, and the aim is to provide uh, high quality data information to understand the major environmental process and mostly all these complicated geochemical, biochemical uh, interaction which happen al across the whole water column. So why to observe the deep sea? A part of what I have said already, ocean played a crucial role in the human well-being. Deep ocean knowledge would certainly help us a lot about understanding process like degradation and loss of biodiversity and how impacting the marine resource exploitation. Maybe Jan will talk a little bit about this. Ocean circulation, which completely regulate the climate on Earth and how this affecting the evolution of the climate change in the, in the Earth. And the natural hazards such as tsunamis, earthquake and uh, eruptions. And well, recently, or more or less recently, we have this Fukushima earthquake that uh, produced economic crisis, uh, well, 10 point uh, decrease in the um, gross domestic product in Japan, even a change on the axis of the earth. So the days now are, I don't know how many milliseconds shorter than before. So I think these are important that affect the population and not only the coastal area. So the mission is to support, uh, as mentioned, marine ecosystem, climate change and geohazard mainly and to achieve a sustainable management and protection of the marine resource and to understand these complex interactions. Well, we have two, mainly two types of, uh, uh, of infrastructure. One is the standalone, which are uh, observatories which are far away from everywhere and it's difficult to reach. Um, so what we are doing is we record and we send some part of this uh, information to the surface boy and the surface boy through satellite that we can have it on the lab. And the other one is the, um, the cable observatory, which is a suite of multi-sensor systems that record many different uh, essential ocean variables. The advantage is we have energy and at the same time, and we can even from the laptop at home, I can change the sample rate of whatever, um, which is very dangerous, by the way, or whatever sensor we are having, me or whatever user. So this is depend on the, on the permission of the user. Well, this uh, slide I put it in purpose um, because um, uh, I guess that uh, the critical thing to, to enhance uh, in general research infrastructure, and in particular dealing with the ocean, is to, to increase substantially the collaboration. I mean, in the central part, you see all these uh, different uh, European research infrastructure, Euroargo, Danubios, EMBRC, ICOS, LifeWatch, uh, ourselves, etc. And I think mm, we have this mm, different type of approach, which is platform specific or environmental specific or process or, or discipline or even areas. I mean, the point is we should collaborate and deliver already information on a fairness uh, way to European observing, uh, Ocean Observing System, to Eurogus, to Copernicus, and we have a very good re relation with this uh, worldwide international organization which is called DOS, which is Deep Ocean Observing System. Well, I put here as a reference is, um, the main significant stressors that affect the, the marine. I mean, climate change, you know what is happening in the serious, uh, well, we are suffering every day and this summer in particular all over Europe. I mean, the excessive greenhouse uh, 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 gases that affect seriously the ocean with an increase of acidification, which um, will produce in a shorter time a very um, important consequence on the trophic chain, warming, and uh, the oxygenation of the, of the water column. And biodiversity uh, protect marine and coastal system to promote a sustainable marine fisheries uh, industry, for instance, and to preserve uh, the marine habitat, otherwise uh, to avoid the point, the point of no return. And in pollution, I mean, this is a catastrophic situation all over the place, particularly in the Mediterranean. We deploy between five 
millions, five millions on 30 millions of tons of plastic, and just only 1% of the plastic remains at the surface or at the floating, and the rest is going directly to, to the bottom or to the seafloor. Um, recently, one famous uh, marine, uh, uh, marine uh, uh, research was telling that this is not the bad news. You say, well, why? It's not the bad news because instead of uh, having all the plastic uh, around, at least the plastic is going to the bottom and then there is some sedimentation. So it may hope that uh, not 100% of this uh, plastic deployment will enter into the trophic chain, which is the consequence that uh, could be terrible for the human health. Well, I put this slide here because um, we are doing something in terms of environmental research infrastructure in a close collaboration all over Europe. Uh, this is supported by the MFREFER project, and we are a total of 26 European research infrastructure dealing with not only with the ocean and water, but also land, life, air, and while well, you see at the bottom all these main, I think we are almost all of the uh, key research infrastructure and, and not only networks and other stakeholders, which uh, has something to do about the environmental issues. Well, the links, we have a strong link with the project, of course, with EOS Future. We listen today about EOS Future. I will have a 30 second. Aging, Eurofleet, Embrifer, etc. With industry, we are setting up through the Enrich project a way to strengthen clearly the connection between the research infrastructure in general with the industry because, well, everybody talk about the industry, but at the end, when you go to each of the research infrastructure, apparently there's no much connection, not much uh, uh, working together, which I think we need to change this drastically in this new decade. And infrastructure, we have a memorandum of understanding with um, EMBRC, with Euro Argo, not with ICOS and with many of them. So we have good relation. Indeed, we are preparing now uh, a white paper that is going to be um, out uh, in the next coming month. And that to end, this is Sharon. Uh, the EMSO achievement is, in, of course, in the scientific community, which is our primary user, is to world-class science to offer high-quality data and products and opportunities. With policymakers, we talk uh, in the General Assembly today a lot, and without having clearly the, the policymakers sitting there, an increase of the uh, synoptic and aggregate information on the marine health, and uh, an efficient exploitation of the sea. And then the society, I think, we are um, very aware about uh, in the marine domain about the, the health of the ocean and about all the global process and we have a very active participation in this opportunity which is the United Nations Decade for the Ocean Science and which I think is more than any other thing is an opportunity for have a strong collaboration with all the marine research. Thank you very much, that's all. Thanks a lot, uh, Are there any questions or comments? No? Then, yeah. What? I don't see the... <laughs> yes. Ah, no, he's back. Yeah. No. You find the... We are persistent. I'm sorry. You will never delete this. <coughs> it is a bit. No, I think you can do it. No, but we have lost the. the uh, you see the. No, no I, we don't see the. Ah. We lost the the arrow. I don't know what it is. Ah, <coughs> uh, yeah, but uh, I want it back here. <laughs> <laughs> you have to tell me. You have to tell us how to bring it back. Yeah. Uh, huh? How did you manage? Uh, Just <laughs> to go <laughs> on the uh, on the oh, Okay. Update. <laughs> no, no, no! Don't restart the computer. I think. 
Uh, that's yours. Oh, it's a PDF. That's right. Uh, it's a PDF. Yeah. Okay, Thanks. Well, hello, I'm um, Jan van Averbeke. That's how you pronounce these difficult uh, <laughs> Dutch names. Uh, no, um, we need the. <laughs> no, you have to put this in the other screen. Okay, but how? Uh, I don't. Yeah, okay. I don't know. Me neither. Technology, we are not. <laughs> That's a good uh, or the Old style. Ah, okay. It's a PDF, so. Uh, yeah. That's it. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're the best. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I'm Jan van I'm actually I'm at home. I'm working here, um, and I'm representing EMBSC on behalf of the our director who uh, could not uh, could not be here. Um, so uh, again, this is also marine, but then it's biodiversity. It's it's but uh, it's biology rather than uh, working with with uh, environmental variable or physical chemical variables. EMBSC is focusing on on biology. So actually our, our, our mission is, is to understand eh, how life in ocean is organized and what, what, and what it is doing there. And also unlock, unlock I should say, eh, its potential for human use in a sustainable way. That's, uh, that's important. And that's then our first challenge eh, indeed. That means that we should uh, liaise with, uh, with, universe, with, with, um, with industry. And that's at the moment, that's a, that's a challenge. Eh? One, one way or another, uh, we don't find each other. Um, that's maybe because research infrastructures are still unknown uh, things to, uh, to industry, or it's maybe because we speak a different language um, at the moment. That's something we need, to, we, we need to work on. We're also a distributed research infrastructure. So we are active in 10 uh, member countries, as the geographical spread is rather similar as with uh, my, my colleague. Um, we have 70 stations that are, that are involved there, and we're actually offering services, not data, but services. Eh? Our headquarters in Paris, where we actually have seven people that are full-time working, and that's the guy I'm, uh, I'm replacing, that's uh, uh, Nicolas Pitt, our, uh, our director. <coughs> So we offer services in six broad categories. I'm not going to go in detail in there, but mainly what we do is we offer access to either the marine environment, to our research vessels, to, to divers, to uh, equipment, and so on and so on, or to biological resources. Then you think of biobanks, cell lines, model organisms, all these kind of things. So that's really uh, the marine biology part. But the second main thing we're doing is we're offering access to our facilities to our equipment. And so that's either the experimental facilities, either technology platforms. The idea is that some of them are very well developed um, in Europe, and it doesn't make sense that everybody, every country is financing, uh, buying the same um, technology or funding the same technology. It makes much more sense to send people to the places where that technology is available. So we can save on that kind of money and invest in research, researchers, uh, personnel to actually um, run that infrastructure. Um, so that we had more than 400 services, that's, that becomes a mess if you're not organizing this. And for, for a user, this becomes really difficult to figure out like where to go to do a certain thing. So we have managed, we, we are managing this through a single access point. So you actually see it's like the booking.com for marine services. Eh? So you have a filtering system to the left, which you, which you recognize, and then to the right, you actually get a narrowing down of the, of, of the options that we can uh, that we can uh, that, we, that we can give you. <clears throat> and then this is really uh, centrally managed. Uh, the, the, the people in Paris are taking care of that request, making sure that it is according to all rules uh, within the countries within Europe, and so on and so on. These things do not come for free. 
I mean, if you come, if you go to an institute and you, you go there to use the machines or somebody is sampling for you and sending you organisms, it needs to be paid for. So and there's lots of, lots of uh, um, possibilities to, to, to get this paid. Um, that's the next challenge. I mean, convincing funding agencies that, that they should give us the mandate to, to do this, eh? to, to have money allocated for going to research infrastructure and to your proposal. Very often, that's not the case. Uh, it used to be in Belgium, for instance, where research infrastructures were in uh, Belspo funding calls, which is our, our, our funder. And uh, lately, it's, it's gone out. I, I think that's, that's a pity. Eh? Because on one hand, these funding agencies invest in these things. So on the other hand, I think that the mandate should be strong. It should also be visible in proposals and so on. And so on. <clears throat> this is something we do a bit of biological observation as well. So the kind of observation that EMSO is doing then in biology. So we just started last year the European Marine Omics Biodiversity Observation Network, which is now endorsed as, a, as an action in the Union Decade of uh, Science since, um, since last week. So what they actually do there is at 16 sites in Europe at the same time during the month and every two months, we take samples from water sediment and hard substrates. Um, which we ideally process immediately, and other ones are saved for biobanking, and we're going to look at them within 10 years, uh, and they're analyzed through a centralized omics platform. So we do produce a little bit of data, not too much, but the, what, what we get from there is not only the data, but we also get standard operational protocols. I mean, it's done at the same method all over Europe, and it's a there's a data management plan, so it guarantees open, fair data. So that's one of the things that we can also offer. Eh? This is what, what research infrastructures can offer. That's a high quality, standardized methods all over, over Europe. <clears throat> the challenge we contribute to, to the left, yeah, is actually the ones that are really in our comfort zone. And that's helping to, uh, uh, to realize or to meet expectations with regard to, to the blue growth, blue growth strategy, uh, mission starfish, or the real marine things. But we're also now contributing to things which are outside our comfort zone. That's what you see to the right. And that's, again, a challenge. Eh? Farm to fork, aqua, marine aquaculture as a new way of, of, of producing food. Um, we are trying to offer, we are, we are in a project uh, that pr pr provides services for cancer research. Uh, we also, in this Isidori project, as producing, as uh, offering cell lines, uh, techniques, and model organisms for, uh, um, what is it, infectious out outbreaks. And so this is, this is a response to the COVID outbreak. And this is, again, a challenge. Yeah. We need to make marine eh, sexy for those guys. It was really, really difficult to get marine organisms and cell, and cell lines, th these kind of things, into the cancer, um, into the cancer um, project. Because, I mean, you do cancer, you, do, you, you use mice. Eh? You don't use marine cells, or so on and so on. Although a lot of things have been developed from marine organisms. Eh? There's, there's, there is cancer medicines that, that out, come out of sponges and, uh, and, uh, and so on and so on. But it's really difficult to, to convince them. Be a bit too small. But look at this. I mean, the ocean is 70% of the world. This is not 70% of the audience. It's not, it's not sitting here. Um, so benefits from uh, research infrastructures, I think that's by, by standardizing things, by working together, uh, we produce things that are, that are, that are uh, one plus one is three, uh, uh, as you say here. So that gives us really uh, leadership in global marine research. Uh. We, do, we have these standardized operational procedures, but we also, with EMBC, at least that's what we do, we, we, we implement at European scale these international or, or um, obligations that are there. That's the Nagoya Protocol and the access, what is it, access and benefit sharing, um, which is really hard if you're at the institute level. But if we pave the road at the research infrastructure level, then it can be much, uh, it's much more easy to implement at, um, at the level of the, of, of the, of the, of the um, participating institutes. And we also provide a solid home eh, for, for things uh, that we are there for 20, 25 years, which is different from the lifetime of a project. Um, <clears throat> cooperation, yes, we cooperate a lot, as you can see, since we, in Ericsson's four years, these are the projects that we do with other research infrastructures, it's a very wide field, so this is working, this is okay. Um, and as already mentioned, there's this Envy community uh, that, is, uh, that is, seems to be working as well, I'm not in there, but that's what I hear. Um, 
One of the things my director asked me to say, I mean the director of EMBSC, is that well, we don't need additional fora for communication, but maybe we need more um, efficient way of using them. Eh? Apparently, research infrastructure, they need to be funded, so they spend a lot of time talking on how to get funded. While if you put them up, up front in funding schemes and you give them a mandate, then they can save time uh, there. Uh, that's it. I hope I'm within time. Thank you very much. Questions or comments? Then I give the floor to yes, I will stay here because uh, <laughs> I, I do not have slide. I'm Margherita Cappelletto from the National Research Council of uh, Italy, representing the Ministry of University and Research and uh, uh, Mr. La Raffaele Liberali. Um, he is used not to use slide, so <laughs> I'm a bit in his uh, line. And also, as uh, today, we saw the two former panels uh, were without uh, a slide. But uh, I think it's uh, very important to um, present the partnership because uh, the partnership as an uh, instrument is really a new thing, that uh, it's a new instrument that uh, came out with the, uh, this framework program, Horizon Europe, and uh, basically uh, the European countries, member states and associated countries together with the Commission will join together a, a single effort on different uh, realms. We are one of the 39, uh, if I'm not uh, wrong, partnership that uh, are uh, already uh, running or will run in the future. And our target is the uh, sustainable blue economy. Um, 25 countries among member states and associated countries and 60 uh, partners. Uh, I'm Please also to have here our co-coordinators from Norway, Katrin, that many of you, I guess, uh, uh, know. Uh, uh, the idea uh, is really to mobilize uh, the uh, blue economy community and far beyond to reach the European policy target of the uh, green transformation, the digital transformation, and of course uh, the uh, recovery. Uh, to do this, the Sustainable Blue Economy Partnership will implement uh, impactful research and innovation uh, projects through call of proposal, together with a series of additional and structuring uh, activities. Um, we have uh, um, a big responsibility in this, and in particular in trying to build a, a, a community that is ready, is prepared to uh, co-design the activities and to respond to this uh, uh, call for, for proposal. As from my question that I addressed in the uh, morning session, uh, our strategy is pan-European, but builds and, and, and um, takes into consideration the uh, sea basin and regional agenda, because at the end of the story, uh, the impact we should have uh, is local. The opportunity to exchange practice, uh, build capacities across uh, basin is there. So uh, the, the strategic research and innovation agenda from which uh, we have then uh, uh, derived uh, our priority objectives and, and the areas uh, of intervention for the first uh, set of calls uh, are really the result uh, of, uh, of, the, the, uh, of the work uh, by sea basin representatives into this new pan-European uh, effort. Uh, if I have to address some of the of the um, question, the, the general question that were uh, uh, put by the organizer, uh, very concretely, when uh, um, uh, we are speaking about thematic area of, of in, a thematic area of intervention, like uh, the uh, development and validation of the ocean uh, digital twin, of the digital twin of the ocean at sea basin scale, this is the name, the, the claim, the title of one of our uh, uh, thematic intervention area. Uh, um, we cannot uh, avoid to have uh, infrastructure and all the uh, data that different infrastructure, not only satellite data, but also biogeochemical data can 
provide to the uh, community in order to develop this this uh, uh, the, the action uh, in, and the solution under this area. Uh, let me speak about another uh, area of intervention on which we are focusing, the Blue Generation Marine Structure, which envisages the possibility to combine different uh, typology of uh, maritime activities uh, with the um, in, in a single platform with, with mo offshore with multipurpose. Again, it's impossible not to uh, uh, co collaborate, not to deploy all the uh, uh, infrastructure that can uh, sustain the, the development of the of the innovation, uh, innovative solution. As well as, uh, because uh, also Jan mentioned that they work with the aquaculture system, uh, our uh, intervention area on enabling the green tra transition uh, for blue food production. This is another example. So. This is just to mention uh, the, the concrete, uh, um, let's say, needs of, of collaborating with, uh, with research of uh, infrastructure. From the opportunity side, um, one of the general objectives of our partnership is to develop innovative governance framework. Um, and I think that here the, the opportunity has a two-level uh, um, nuance. <laughs> From one side, again, it's with the data that we can uh, inform policymaker and uh, provide uh, innovative ideas for 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 uh, evidence-based governance framework. At the same time, I think that through collaboration with with the research infrastructure, we can develop a governance framework per se per per. per the, uh, uh, for the for the uh, research infrastructure uh, uh, themselves, um, as we have a, a very important opportunity uh, of rationalizing the landscape. Uh, ocean research infrastructure are many are distributed. The sustainable blue economy partnership needs to rely also on. Uh, uh, the research infrastructure and, and stakeholders that are coming from different areas, like the uh, ICT, for example, it's uh, it's really uh, we were speaking before with uh, with a colleague from the Sorbonne University leading uh, digital uh, infrastructure. Uh, of course, we will need to connect with the social science uh, and humanities, as we already did when preparing our uh, pr proposal. So, in this sense, I see uh, an opportunity. Uh, uh, in terms of optimizing the collaboration, I think that one of the answer is uh, uh, in the co-design, and the co-design means to think, think things together from the very beginning, design things together. Uh, of course, we are speaking as a stakeholder for the infrastructure uh, world, but uh, the, 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 this co-design should engage uh, user first, uh, the private sector, of course, so uh, uh, as a, a different actor. Uh, and uh, to conclude with what I said this morning, I think that there are many things the research infrastructure can offer, uh, but seeing themselves uh, as a, a real capacity development hub uh, from, from the perspective of the regional uh, needs, I think is one of the, of the um, main features that a, a research infrastructure can offer. I think that uh, uh, facilities are there, instruments are also there, alignment of national programs are there to really develop new skills, updated skills, and, and, uh, and capacity in general, as we heard this morning. So more or less, uh, uh, of course, uh, I uh, can answer question more in detail about this uh, project that really just, just started the 1st of September. So uh, we will, uh, maybe this is an important uh, uh, information. Our uh, first uh, call for proposal will be launched in February 2023. We are drafting the call text now. And uh, the, the, uh, so it's an opportunity, this one for everyone. Yes, thank you very much. I also uh, don't have any slides, so I can say here. Now, the three questions, uh, uh, needs and opportunities for, for um, 
um, research infrastructures in relation to Mission Ocean. Uh, difficult for me to say which are your needs. Uh, easier to say uh, that uh, probably Mission Ocean and Water Seas an important opportunities for uh, research infrastructure uh, because uh, uh, Mission Ocean is uh, um, driven by research and innovation, but actually uh, what we aim at is really to address major challenges uh, for the health of, of the ocean and, and our fresh waters. So I think Mission Ocean is an opportunity. And then what would be interesting is to see which are uh, your opportunities, the opportunities that you have to be involved in Mission Ocean. And I think there are, uh, I can identify some of them, but of course I do expect also you to come up with uh, uh, some uh, ideas and, and suggestions. Just to frame a bit what we do in the mission uh, and which are our objectives, there are three policy objectives. Uh, one is about the preservation and, uh, and restoration of uh, uh, our uh, seas and fresh water, so we also cover rivers and lakes. Uh, and of course, uh, of their biodiversity. Second object, and we have a number of policy targets, which are the policy targets which are also embedded in major legislation. For example, uh, the achievement of 30% of strictly protected, uh, of, uh, of marine protected areas and 10% of strictly protected areas. To restore 25,000 kilometers of uh, uh, free uh, flowing rivers. Uh, or uh, to address uh, uh, the um, uh, nature restoration targets. Uh, you know that now there is a nature restoration law which has been adopted by the Commission, and uh, once the whole process uh, with uh, uh, Council and Parliament will be over, uh, there will be a number of targets which become mandatory for Member States. So, first objective, as I said, protection and restoration of uh, marine and freshwater ecosystem uh, and biodiversity. Second objective uh, is uh, prevent and eliminate pollution, any type of pollution. Um, in our first uh, initiatives, we have addressed uh, plastic and microplastics, uh, then uh, uh, chemicals. Uh, we also want to address uh, other pollutants like uh, nutrient losses from soil, and this is why we intend to work together with uh, uh, mission uh, soil, uh, but also uh, heavy metals or other types of pollutants. And then the third uh, objective for us is uh, uh, the sustainability uh, of, of our blue economy. It's uh, um, carbon neutrality, uh, and uh, uh, circularity. Here we would like to address all different sectors. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, we uh, major stakeholders in this area are, uh, are uh, uh, economic uh, uh, actors. And then uh, these three objectives are complemented by two enablers, because the mission is uh, 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 wants also to build um, a marine uh, knowledge system, and actually what we want to deliver under the marine uh, knowledge system, the mission knowledge system, is uh, a digital twin for the ocean. And maybe uh, Nicolas, who is uh, here, uh, may add something on, on uh, uh, where we stand, uh, what we are doing for the uh, digital European digital twin ocean. And the other component enabling uh, uh, let's say, uh, pillar of the mission is the mobilization of, of the public, so uh, citizens' engagement, and this is an important part because in all our activities uh, we want to engage with the citizens, we want to have activities based on uh, citizen science, so citizens can contribute, and we do expect all different uh, initiatives also to cover these uh, aspects. We work on uh, uh, four main sea basins, but this doesn't mean that uh, we focus our, our activities there. Uh, the four basins are uh, the Mediterranean Sea Basin, 
uh, we have the Baltic and North Sea Basin, we have the Atlantic and Arctic Sea Basin, and then we have uh, the Danube River Basin. Uh, we have a number of activities which are focusing explicitly on these uh, four uh, sea basins and the river basin, but actually we also have many other activities which are uh, completely open to all different basins. And then uh, the regional dimension is also something very important. We have embedded in all our activities this idea of associated regions and probably there you can play also a role because actually we want to make sure that all the innovative solutions that are developed uh, through the mission and with the mission are uh, replicable, are scalable at regional level. Uh, of course, uh, uh, local authorities very often also need you know, uh, some evidence to scale up and replicate a uh, uh, number of solutions. So uh, all in all, I think that uh, the mission is an opportunity for you. Uh, you can be directly involved in many of our uh, calls because, of course, we cover uh, the, research, the research and innovation activities and, and, and project. But more than this, I think that uh, you can also be instrumental for the mission to um, help us to create the critical mass which is needed to address the objectives that I was mentioning. And this is why we have launched a mission charter we call all major stakeholders to submit actions. Uh, action is, is uh, mm, along the lines you mentioned, the, uh, the science decade of, of UN is a bit more along the same line. So we do expect to see stakeholder, stakeholders engaged in contributing to the mission objective. So uh, you can go to the mission site. There is a, uh, the possibility for you uh, to uh, submit an action and become part of the mission family. Actually, it's also uh, the way to trigger possible co collaboration with uh, uh, other stakeholders which are involved in, uh, in the mission. Uh, I also wanted to, um, uh, to address, and this is to address the question on, on what you can offer uh, you as a research infrastructure to, uh, to the mission. And how can uh, improve our collaboration? This is a reflection that uh, we would be pleased to make uh, with you. Uh, it's, uh, of course, I mean, I don't have any, any, any answer, but for sure the mission is not only a research and innovation call for proposal, proposal published in the, in the work program. It is much more than this, and we need uh, really all stakeholders to uh, join efforts and forces to achieve the objectives. I think uh, since uh, Nicholas is here, uh, could be uh, also useful for you to understand a bit more about the digital twin ocean. Yeah, maybe before we restate what you said, Roberta, that yes, the mission is an opportunity for marine research infrastructure, but I think it's almost a, a duty <laughs> in the sense that restoring the ocean by 2030 is an immense challenge which cannot be solved just by the work program for the, the ocean mission. It's, it's an objective which needs the contribution of many programs, of many running initiatives, um, far beyond just a few goals for research proposals. And the research infrastructure has, of course, a, an essential role as you cannot manage what you don't know and you don't know what you don't see or observe. And, the role of the research infrastructure in observing, collecting data, and transforming that data into knowledge is absolutely essential. Um, and there I would like to come back to the point that was raised by Juan Ho, which is, it's all about cooperation. And it is all about cooperation because we need to have a strategic approach to the marine observation. We have several initiatives which try to go in that direction, and this is the European Ocean Observing System, which trying to do that, uh, we need to make the link with Goose, the Euro Goose. Um, but it is absolutely essential that the observing community in Europe takes a, a strategic approach. And for that, the partnership which um, Margarita presented might be a key element in that uh, discussion. It's 
as she said, it's a new, it's a new body in, in the landscape of uh, the research and innovation programs. It's not the Aeronet or the Cofund as we used to know, where it was essentially about joint goals between the, the funding agencies of the different member states. They really aim at structuring the communities. And in the ocean community, the research infrastructure have a critical role again. So if together with the state sustainable blue economy partnership, different marine infrastructure could reflect on a strategic way to approach observation to make sure that there is a way to ensure their long-term subsistence together with the European Commission, but most essentially with the member states. It's the funding for the observation essentially comes from the member states. And so it is essential that we have this systemic approach and to, to the observation which gathers the European Commission, the research ministries, and the environment ministries. And I have a stake, personal stake at, at that, because for the digital twin, we will need all this to be effective. So to collect the information exhaustively, or if not exhaustively, in a smart way, and to make sure that the data is made available through a system which will be part of the digital twin ocean. So I really hope that together we can, we can work towards the directions. Thank you. I suggest that we, since we are not so numerous, we go around the table, all of us, if the panelists would like to move and to be here. So, uh, I yeah. May I ask a question? Sure. Uh, I will be a little bit provocative. Go ahead. Uh, of course. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm anxious now. <laughs> uh, I think that we cannot continue to burn a thousand tons of fuel uh, using our scientific It can be a, a European challenge to, to try to, to make a, a, a clean uh, ship. And uh, this is my point. Before to speak about uh, blah, 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 I know uh, EMSO, this is very good. I know, I know all the infrastructure because I am in charge of the infrastructure at CNRS. So I know these uh, tools, very good tools. But this is the problem, and my question is that, is it possible to go toward a, a clean, a clean ship, European ship? I'll give you an answer. Before, can you circulate that? These are the questions we prepared the panel as well. I made copies of that just on the, on the table. Well, to answer your question, you are perfectly right. The point is that, as you know, I'm in charge of the three French fleet at least uh, for research. Uh, we have a deficit of 9 million euros this year because of the price of the gas, I mean, of the, of the, yeah, of the gas. Uh, we don't know what to do, so we are trying to not to cancel so many scientific uh, campaigns, but uh, if we have no fuel, we're stuck. Uh, there, there, have been progress, there have progress made on the new ships uh, that is uh, changing the way they are organized and so on, but they are still using fuel. And the problem is the following, that uh, electricity, yes, it's not going to work. You put so many batteries on the, on the, on the boat, that's it's no it's work. <laughs> impossible. Uh, then the other possibility is hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen is working. The problem with hydrogen, there are not so many harbors where you can buy hydrogen. Today. Today. Right now. No, no. I mean, uh, yeah, we have campaign in Pacific Ocean, uh, Indian Ocean, they sell only fuel, period. No hydrogen, they don't have hydrogen. So my feeling is that hydrogen is the future, but it will take, you know, to change the whole system, I would say 20, 20, 30 years. But your point this is right. It's not a, a, a problem to solve for tomorrow, just tomorrow. I mean. Yeah. But uh, I think it is a point to, so, to so put on the table, I think. Yeah, uh, okay. Yes, go ahead, and then Roberta. 
two things. First of all, we have the co-program partnership with Zoot, Zero Emission Waterborne Platform, which is run by the Waterborne community, and picking up parts of the former Martera, which is maritime industries. And this is the core essence of what they're working on, the new generation, but also retrofitting. Okay. But uh, in, in step, we are also working on the issue on the intervention area five on greening of technologies sure. because if you're using I, I was surprised to learn that trawlers globally spend more energy than the whole aviation field <laughs> uh, and that is a very specific problem because they go in rotations it's not like the ordinary maritime transport so we need to connect and cooperate with the youth community to ensure that the needs of our fleet, which is also important for the economy of the union with food and the opportunities we have there, which requires that we also bring this technological community of the maritime producers together with the biology community and understand the needs of, of this kind of activity. Okay. But I'd like, if I may, as I have the floor, to ask another question because, I mean, uh, we need one Exxon Valdez and the problem is, doesn't help how much we are monitoring pollution. So my question is a little bit to the European Commission on the digital twin because we do know that the industry to a large extent is using digital twins as a backup function, for instance, when you have unmanned vehicles that they use it for navigation purposes because, and also for manned vehicles, so it's a security, they know what is happening with them. They can also use it, for instance, to reduce, to reduce costs when you're looking at agriculture, which is also a topic which uh, uh, I think in NBRC someone uh, talked about how to expand. So we use it, for instance, to look at how broodstocks are behaving and to bring that into it to to look for what would be the perfect uh, model for what uh, a species which it would then uh, make as a broodstock uh, as a support mechanism. So my question is, uh, are we solely, not that it is big and super important, but is the digital twin concept something we're thinking about solely in the concept of understanding the system and for planning of users, which are very important, but also as a tool to be used on the third leg of the mission, which is to, to green the blue economy, and to make it more resilient and to avoid accidents and the like. That, that's my question. Uh, and it's a question because it's also a mission in the step, and like Nicholas says, it's not that because one does it, the other should it. We need critical mass, and we need to make sure that we're pulling in the right direction together. Yeah. I just wanted to compliment what was said with the uh, decarbonization of the uh, waterborne transport. I think that there is also another urgent issue that uh, uh, for which we need uh, solutions, uh, which are the small vessels mm -hmm. and in particular the uh, uh, fishermen vessels, mm -hmm. the very small ones. Many of them are not, uh, you know, going uh, uh, fishing any longer because of fuel costs. So it is not only an issue of of uh, pollution; it is also an issue of improving the energy efficiency of these vessels because it is a real problem that many of our fishermen are, are facing uh, uh, lately. Uh, and there, there are not many uh, uh, options. So I think that it would be important to take also this into account, you know, not only the big ships. Uh, uh, and, and, and that's it. Thank you. Okay. You have to use the microphone because they are recording. Please uh, use the microphone. Yes, uh, answering first to you, Catherine. I think it goes without saying that the digital twin is there to support the three mission objectives. And, and the digital twin is not a big science project for the scientists. The final aim is to provide tools for all the ocean actors, and that includes the scientists, but it includes uh, the citizen, it includes all the, the, the private enterprises that operate at sea, it includes uh, the local communities and the governments for their planning. So yes, it, it is for the users, so 
definitely. Now to your question um, about uh, the ships, <laughs> the research vessels. Yes, and you, you, you may know that it is one of the priorities that the G7 countries in the Futures of the Seas and Ocean Initiative have identified to us very much pushed by, uh, by the UK. Unfortunately, they're not uh, at the table here. But um, I think they're probably, it, it will take time, as you say, be, before we come to a research fleet, which is uh, <laughs> with a zero emission capacity. But there may be ways to reduce the capacity or the emission by other strategies, which is go beyond just the research vessels. Huh? We can maybe rely on other ships and. I see that uh, Agnes is there. The digital twin ocean and the way to have that systematic approach to the planning may also help reducing uh, the emissions just by making the system more efficient. So there are many ways to reduce the emission from the research uh, fleets. Just to complement that in the very last uh, steps of the process of uh, preparing the next uh, work program on um, infrastructure for 2023, 2024, uh, thank you. Um, we just added a topic on the greening of research infrastructure. So it does not solve all the problem, but it's just uh, to show that uh, the Commission is aware and adapting as much as possible. But it will be a great uh, challenge again to, to, for Europe to, to try to go in this direction. We, we know that it's not uh, so easy. Um, just one fact, I don't know, maybe it will take longer if a boost could come also from, um, let's say, some legal framework, and I'm referring to the studies for the emission control area, like there is a life project that is uh, uh, studying uh, a Mediterranean emission control area, so maybe whenever this will come in to force, <laughs> um, it could also be a boost for, for uh, this. Um, one other comment, I think uh, um, listening to Catherine's answer and uh, uh, she correctly mentioned the, the, the zero emission water bond transport platform, but also there is a partnership, the zero emission water bond transport partnership, which is slightly different from us as an instrument because uh, it's uh, co-programmed, so it's mainly funded by <laughs> the commission. I, I can be wrong, but um, uh, and then listening to Roberta's uh, presentation of the mission. Um, synergy is a keyword for the Sustainable Blue Economy Partnership uh, uh, because there are 49 partnerships, so there are other partnerships uh, like the one dealing with food, the other one with biodiversity, with the water system, water for all. W one of our um, crucial activity in building this community is to enable synergies with these other a crucial actor, and of course to contribute to the mission. So this was something missing from my presentation that I wanted to complement because in terms of uh, strategy is uh, really a big part of our, uh, of our strategy. Yes. Well, just to, to answer partially what you said, what I think is really important in terms that we need to show uh, from our uh, member state, the way to proceed in research and trying to be as less footprint as possible. If you look into the European research fleet, it's incredible old, incredible old. I, what you are asking is to go to the zero emission, I think will take time, but to, to do already something, we can do it by the strong renovation of the European fleet because the modern engines, the way they, uh, throw uh, pollution to, to the ocean is 80% uh, less than the old engines. And um, if you look into the, into the age of the European research fleet, it's incredible. And if you look into the age of the fish uh, ship in, in Europe, it's even older. I mean, there are ships which has engines of more than 50 years, so the maintenance is absolutely incredible. I mean, it's the more inefficient way to, to survive. The, but the economy is putting out in place because, well, if it's inefficient, you should stop this <laughs> because yeah. there's no business there. No, you're perfectly right, but uh, we are replacing one of the ships of the French fleet. Two years ago, it was 25 million. Now it's 40 million for the same ship, more or less. We have improved a little bit, but the prices have incredibly increased. 
So it's difficult to, to renew the, the ship system. No, you need a lot of money, that's what I meant. It's not that we can do an effort at the European level. Because if you have, well, no, if you have a design of a, a zero emission vessel, you can uh, co-design this in different... This is uh, not uh, ideal, not, <laughs> not the dream, but this is feasible and it's possible. Okay. Let's go. I guess we are, I would like you to answer, to look at the question that the panel has prepared with me. <laughs> and you give me some input for, to, for that, because I have to say a few, a few intelligent things in 40 minutes. <laughs> Yes, I look at the, the the third chapter here and the question around uh, how to cooperate at the global or international level. Uh, I, I'm I'm really surprised when I come to all these uh, European meeting, which is the, the the focus is always on European project and uh, program, etc. But there are initiatives uh, at the global level that exist for sharing data. Uh, I'm working for GBIF, but there is OBIS, there is all other things. I, I have not seen these logos on your presentation. And I, I would like to, to tell you that I, I'm sure that there are a lot of European data that does not go to these global uh, initiatives, and that's really something we can fix very easily, I think. Well, it depends on the discipline. In some cases, they yeah, share. In other cases, uh, yeah. Yeah. But I agree with your point, too much European level. But the money is coming from Europe and, and, and European states. That's an argument. Yeah, I don't know if uh, how you want to, to organize these, uh, these discussions, but uh, if we follow uh, the three levels that are mentioned here in the list of questions, uh, I think, and I would like to reiterate what I said uh, about the associated regions, so this concept that we have in, uh, uh, in the mission, uh, which is the role that you can play to help uh, regions uh, to uh, benefit from a number of solutions which are already maybe there, that can be replicated, that can be uh, scaled up. Uh, do you have a role to play as a research infrastructure? Can you provide local authorities with the evidence which sometimes is needed to take decision? Uh, is this something that you are envisaging? And this is particularly relevant also for, for the mission because we really uh, are trying uh, not to leave anybody behind and address needs at local level uh, for which solutions are available and can be uh, deployed. So, your, I'm sorry, but I'm not sure I understood perfectly well. Your point is that the mission can answer the two first question or the first question or what? I think this is a very important topic, and um, I am completely convinced that um, uh, we are capable already most of the research infrastructure to, to reach the level low at the regional side. But my impression, as being the director of an, uh, of an ERIC already for five years, is we don't have the maturity enough to give um, the, the boarding or the power to the different regions which are members of this uh, consortium. Um, I think we need to go to the level similar to, I don't know if you know, in Eurogoose, for instance, we have the rules, which is the regional ocean of service system, which uh, put, in, instead of uh, having all together, the regions to work together, which is, you feel more close to the problem when you are uh, helping the local uh, people, local authorities, or local SMEs, and they trust you because you are part of the region or the business. Sometimes when we have a big European organization, so well, well, these people are coming here. I have nothing to do with, so it's a matter of trust. But I think we have the tools already. We should promote, and maybe the mission, also mission could help the research, the research infrastructure to, to go the, at the high speed 
and to get closer to the, to the region because they're waiting for us in a way. Say, so what are you doing? Because you are doing some sort of a global thing and you don't consider the tiny things which are fundamental for, for the global. Add something to your, to your comment before I give you the, the mic, Catherine. Yes, of course, there are international initiatives and, and I'm sure that many of you contribute to providing data to these initiatives, but it's also essential that the data cross not only the borders, but also the disciplines. And this is the most difficult, I think, today, is to have this cross-discipline approach to data. And this is what we would like to do in particular through to Emonet and to the, the digital twin of the ocean is to make sure that data from different sectors, different disciplines can be used together to, to make a model. And we have to do our human part of this. Well, I'm now not speaking in SPEP. I'm not speaking as the research council. I'm speaking as a former industry representative and former working in governance for many years. Uh, when I was working in industry, a typical issue we would ask is, and I was in aquaculture, what, how can we move fish from one area to the other without uh, entering into illnesses? Uh, where can we place our infrastructure farm to avoid that we are having too little currents, etc., etc.? Uh, we were speaking to the planners, and I'd say we have a systemic challenge at the governance level, like Margarita said, innovative governance uh, at the global level here in Europe. I think I counted at the time something equivalent to 150, 70 ministries involved in the ocean, one way or the other. So, so having a strategic coordination, which was said downstairs, is important, but in particular, in addition, on oceans and sea, the competence is often at the regional level. Infrastructures are funded at national level. So this connectivity across the systems requires innovative thinking, in my opinion. We have to put ourselves as infrastructure in those shoes. As a planner, you want to know how much exactly will sea level rise impact on me? How do I plan for the 100 wave, uh, years wave uh, to ensure that my infrastructure is there, out, is not causing problems, being it from uh, the offshore platforms uh, for multi-use in the future, like Margarita spoke about, the security interest, insurance issues. I mean, that's the, that's the issues which industry and planners are preparing for. Uh, and I think we need to sort of uh, translate infrastructures into this. When I worked in the Ministry of Industry uh, back in Norway, I was always struggling to get the Ministry of Finance to fund it infrastructure. Uh, and I would say, but we need the data. Why do we need the data? I want to put money on a hospital for children with cancer. I mean, that's the bargaining you are working against. And, and I'm not saying this to be uh, unfair or anything, but you have to help us communicate what can you do to the people who are there, who are planning the coastal use, uh, what services can you provide? And I. I honestly think, and Nicholas, you've said it many times, it's not about providing them with the data. Then they go blank, their eyes roll back. It's about providing them the services because that's what they need and that implies you need to understand their specific needs. And that's what Margarita is saying, the co-creation, bringing the regional level in, understanding these impacts. And I think we still have a way to go there and I reiterate what Alfa Laval said. We need to bring them in, as also Margarita, we need to bring in not all those stakeholders, but some of them to, to check out in the planning phase how can this be used to serve you? What are your needs? Like in Yerik, you know, the coastal areas, where is the pressure the highest? Where is the pollution the highest? The difficulties for the planners, sorry about this flaming um, comment, but uh, that's what I'd like to have the uh, comment the First here and then... Yeah, thank you. So it's just a reflection on the, the earlier comment about global data. So obviously there's lots of national and EU funded research projects that generate large volumes of data around oceans and marine. And obviously when international 
organizations exist that can act as a repository for those data, then they should be used, whether that's GBIF or, or resources like the European Nucleotide Archives for sequence data in Elixir, for example, which, which I represent. So, and I think the funding agencies themselves, whether that be through future partnerships or the Oceans mission, can encourage research consortia to deposit those data into the recognized repositories. This happens a lot in the in the medical sciences. We see this a lot through the cancer mission. And I think that can be done more and more in the in the field of oceans as well, because these resources exist and many of them are run by research infrastructures represented here. Um, and I think that's a good way of ensuring um, greater use of, of, of open data. I just want to add sort of a comment on what, what you're saying. This is exactly what one of the things that I wanted to, to, to mention during my talk is one of the challenges is getting involved in an early stage as a research infrastructure. So we can actually help the stakeholder, stake, stakeholder sorry, eh? we can ex explain him what we can do, what we cannot do. If we cannot do that, we can get ready to uh, help solving, solving a problem. I've, speaking for EMBC, yes, uh, we have 400 services. I mean, not a single one of these services will help answering that problem. But you can make pipelines. We can combine all these things, and we ha we have the inventory of, of where, where can be done. And but we need to know. It would be good if we know well in advance uh, what what kind of major things we should prepare for, what kind of pipelines we we need to make. The other comment I wanted to make is. At least for EMBSC, we cannot do research. Eh? We facilitate research. You cannot ask. The, it's called a research infrastructure, but we are a research facilitating infrastructure. At least, uh, yeah. Okay, but for lots of people, we don't want to. We don't can compete with universities or knowledge institutes. But we can help them by our equipment, knowledge, and so on to to tackle your problem. Yeah, that's the basic role of the research on the right. To help to do research. It's not doing research by itself. That uh, was the goals they defined at the beginning. That should, that should be clear, I think. Some research, but they don't have the way to do all the research to give them results. Yes? One hope. Many interesting things, topics here. First, I fully agree, cross-domain is a fundamental piece. I mean, without the cross-domain, we are going backwards. I mean, cross-domain means that whatever thing happening in the nature has different components. I mean, not only one research infrastructure, many, and to understand what is going on there, the key point is to be interoperable, to be able to exchange data in a very fast mode that we understand each other. And we are not close yet to this. And this is the way, and I fully agree with what you say, cross-domain is a key issue. What you say about um, you, uh, that, uh, European research infrastructure, we are simply here to deliver data, I think is completely wrong. <laughs> or not to do research, not to do research. Yeah. I mean, if you are providing information and helping the scientists, stakeholders, and if you don't do any research, in a few years you are dead. I mean, this is the Ferrari story that you park the, the car there and you don't do anything anymore. I have this discussion 100 times with, for instance, one very advanced, uh, a research infrastructure, which is the Ocean Network Canada. In the beginning, they say, we are not allowed to do any research because we are here to help scientists, universities, and uh, different stakeholders. And the end of, after a couple of years, they say, it's impossible. We need to do research as well without entering into the competence of the universities. But we need to help. We need to make reports uh, for sometimes, uh, I don't know, about uh, what is the pollution of climate change in the Mediterranean. I mean, to provide, you know, f for instance, every two years, and I think this is something, or every year, NASA sent a report about how is the research in the space, in the water, and everybody is waiting for this, uh, what they say. This is the research infrastructure they can go in this direction, depending on the topic, of course, to give input to the, to the researchers and to many other stakeholders, because the stakeholders are not uh, only the researchers and organizations and universities. And if you don't have a certain balance, I think, in a short time, the research infrastructure is dying. We, we, we do research. We do research yeah. on improving the services. We do research on improving, I mean, we do research and development. So we keep, we're not waiting 
Diğer yani benimle bir işte. Abi dostum ordu böyle. Bu böyle bir şey. So, yeah, so um, um, Jean Leon, I'm the uh, director of the synchrotron in Paris and representing here big collaboration between synchrotron. So I'm really out of my comfort zone, uh, as we said this morning. Uh, but uh, I mean, yeah, uh, I mean this shows this community is attractive. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I would like to comment on, on what you said on pipelines, and I think this is very important because we are providing, I mean, uh, service to your community, uh, probably more on a personal basis at the moment, and I think we should greatly benefit from a more structured uh, approach with, I mean, either partnerships or uh, other infrastructures. And uh, that's really, I mean, we, we have now uh, designed, uh, I mean, uh, a strategy paper where we want to offer targeted access to some strategic communities. And I mean, you are definitely one of them. So that's really uh, something I, I wanted to tell you. And I also fully agree with what you said, because I know that our, uh, when we perform research in your area, this is because we are in the facility people involved in that research. And without that, it, it, it would never happen. Okay. Any comments or questions on this point? Uh, we're still, uh, we're still okay, okay. Uh, because, uh, well, we have to make a sentence. Unless you have other questions or points, uh, well, the time was short, so we cannot do better, and uh, that's it. Uh, I have a question first. Somebody talk about innovative governance. What is the meaning of that issue, I guess? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get the point, that's my question. Because if I talk to, uh, later on about innovative governance, somebody may ask a question, and then <laughs> I will be a little bit... Uh... I, I will try to give a, a provocative answer first, yes. I think. I, I was really laughing at the European Maritime Day, a colleague from... Um, the Copernicus system said the, the ocean digital twin, what is nobody knows. <laughs> I mean, we are building it. In a way, I think this is a, a word to anchor the, the, the opportunity to uh, develop through new, uh, the avail availability of new uh, data and technology, uh, informed and evidence-based uh, solution for the policymaker. Uh, but how this will apply to the, um, let's say, implementation of the directives uh, or uh, uh, the, the different, uh, um, let's say, sector where you can find really innovative governance uh, uh, application, so this is really to, 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 to research, uh, it, it is to be developed. So we need to have, uh, if not, proper projects, uh, but uh, at least uh, studies, uh, workshop to... to, to uh, if I am provocative, what you say is the governance at the level of the EC is not working properly and it has to be innovated? No, it, no, it's sure not. It's not. A, it's <laughs> not at the. Le <laughs> it's not at the level of the sea uh, only. Yeah, it's. It's the. It's the, it's the. It's the complexity of the system that now needs okay. uh, a new. A new uh, thinking. Uh, you have a mic, a mic somewhere. I I agree with Margarita. It is an issue which is also addressed at a very high scale globally when you're dealing with the SDGs, the complexity of governance only around the SDG 14. I think Vladimir said there was 22 UN agencies involved. So how do you, and that is for the, uh, the data system uh, or quantum physics maybe, how do we generate models which simplifies for governance because public authorities are running in many directions to be able to deal with the grand challenges. So that is one, but there's a concrete element as I, I see part of the innovative governance is linked to the green digital transition. In that if Europe wants to, t and Europe will take a global lead in this area, 
we need to combine it with governance measures like taxonomy, like insurances, like uh, giving soft loans to companies who are greening, etc. So you need to again, uh, disentangle the complexity in the system and get these organizations to work together in order to uh, facilitate for new innovative companies and solutions and the like. So that's part, I would say, also of the innovative governance. Today have not been designed to answer to this Exactly. Yes. And, and, uh, we simply need to exactly. And, and we can... Not only that, but it is also true that the, mo the democracy uh, of Europe and internationally is linear. And linear systems are not fit to deal with complex systems. It's very efficient, but yeah, that's the uh, situation. So to, we have to, to give up uh, also a practical uh, example, I think that when uh, I, I was speaking about evidence-based uh, uh, information, we shouldn't forget the economics and uh, social science uh, uh, information because you can build a fantastic model and then you have forgot that uh, there could be a reaction by citizens that you didn't expect at all because this is related with the po psychology of population or whatever. So, and this was not never addressed before. Thank you. Other comments? I, I will try to make a synthesis within two minutes because uh, to be sure that you agree with me. I mean, that, uh, and if I go to jail, I'm not the, alone, <laughs> the only one going to jail. Uh, well, what I have noted, uh, well, it's not in the right order, but uh, you know, uh, we are working, the areas are too much working at the European level. It has to, to move to the international level. That's one comment. There should be a strategic coordination for ocean between states, between Europe, and so on, to make it more efficient. There should be uh, an innovative governance. We discussed that uh, because uh, now it's the complexity of agencies. I make it short because I won't have time to. Uh, and we have to. Uh, what point I noted as well is to ra rationalize the landscape, uh, giving the example of goose, euro goose. Uh, because it's really important to rationalize the system. We discussed also, that's a little bit apart, the decarbonation of the research ships, but it's a, I think it's a critical point for the future, so we have to put that on the table if you agree. And the two last points I have noted is that the ARIs are a basis for the digital twins, that is the digital twins won't work, as, uh, won't work if there are no data from the ARIs and so on, yeah, because you have to, uh, well, it's the same in, in modeling the atmosphere. If you don't have any data, you can have a model, it's working, but you get funny results usually <laughs> if you don't check with the, the measurement. And there is something I, I've written, which is strategic, mo strategic move towards, but I do not remember what it, what, I, what it means. Who was talking of the strategic move towards? Towards what? I, I, I forgot to, read, to write something, so I will cancel that if... Ah, to what stakeholder involvement, okay. That I, uh, maybe I was looking at you and... No, I think it was what Margarita also stated in her... Involvement. You, yes, no, I, I may have to... Use the mic, please, use the mic. Yeah, I may just have one, one comment on the point on decarbonation. I think this is, is to, to, to bring the picture a bit broader. It's really one opportunity where academy and industry can work together and learn how to work together because these kind of challenges are also the one of the maritime industry, how to green and the, the mission of the maritime industry and the, it, it's just orders of magnitude above what any research uh, fleet would, would do. So it, it, it would be interesting maybe also to use this as a, as a test case for the academy and the industry to work together. There's a, a point here on SMEs, but ships of opportunities, uh, there, there are all lines across the ocean that are transmitting data. Maybe that's also ways to improve the, 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 uh, the observatory system. So there are ways, and maybe decarbonation can be a way to, to start working together a bit more. So you mean there should be a better collaboration between research and industry, is that what you meant, or...? 
Well, yeah, that, that's decarbonation of the fleet is, could be a, a, one of the test case, test case okay. to, to, to work together uh, and, and to improve our relations. Uh, I think uh, it's very, um, you reported very well all the points that were raised. What I miss is uh, if uh, this is the right context for research infrastructure, because I miss the research infrastructure role in all the bullets that you were mentioning. So I think this was the main objective of, of the session, that we have to decarbonize the economy. I mean, I think that uh, uh, this, doesn't need to be discussed uh, any longer. I think is you know the role of research infrastructure in relation to number of challenges that we are the facing. The of the sheet is not the role of an infrastructure, but it's the role of research in link with the industry. That's you have to make some research. I have seen here. If from here they have made some some new design to to remove yeah. to to lower by twenty percent the the. the the amount of, of, uh, of fuel you are using because they design well, better the ship. Yeah. That's a, that was a, made in collaboration with industry. That's in any case, we have the Euro fleet, which is more or less a sort of proto-research infrastructure. And in the second place, I mean, uh, the impact of the research uh, fleet, whatever it is, is not only in terms of foil, it's in terms of another type of pollution like noise, like, and this is important, and this affects the species, the life. You know, for instance, yeah, yeah, no, no, but one thing we did, we did uh, some time ago in my country is just reducing the speed of the research vessel to a maximum of nine knots, decrease 90% of yeah. the impact yeah. of, the, yeah, yeah. of the pollution on the environment. So it's incredible. But and save money, even. Yeah. <laughs> That's the problem, I can't tell you that because I know the problem. It's not the problem of research ships, it's the problem of milita military ships oh, no. because they are full speed, yeah, usually. No, 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 I don't. This, that's the way it's working. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, and uh, when you put windmills also, they're rather noisy in the ocean. Oh, oh it's coffee. Well, now we have still five minutes, so... Any other comment? For me, it has been a very lively, it's too short, but really... Sure. I, could you read it again? Because I think we need to, maybe when you spell the points that you need to bring the connectivity in them to the role of infrastructures, could you read them again just to see that that is a clear message? It's not just research, and uh, it's the research infrastructures, it's the ESFRIs and the like. And their You're role in this. You talking about the governance? You know, generally. Oh, generally. Yes, we're speaking about which role infrastructures can play to society. It's not what research can do to society. I think that was the point. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but the and point. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a, it's a tricky question because research infrastructure has been built for research first. That was the first uh, reason to have research infrastructure, not for society. The society point is a recent point. But that's not the point. I thought we were sitting here to see how it could have a dual service to research clearly, but also to serve society. No, Maybe I'm I really misunderstood. No, 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 you are perfectly right. The point is that I have no comment about that. Because research infrastructure, they produce research for research, for research. Then research can use society. But the research infrastructure itself, when you make the measurement of salt in the ocean or something else, people don't care. I'm cynical about that. Yes, Agnes. Um, we uh, have heard example from EMBRC where they try to address directly, uh, yeah. connect to industry and uh, to offer some services. Yeah, but that's, also, that's not society, that's industry. Society. Okay, oh, uh, if you say society, then fine. So users, industry, policy makers. Ah, okay. okay, that's, it's, of, yeah, public, yeah. Oh, yeah, you were that, okay. That, but yeah, so I how... I what you said, because for me, society is, is a society. Not it's not policy makers, it's not... not uh, depends what you call society. 
No, we, we, do, we do a lot of agreeing on that. No, but for, can Go you ahead. hear me? Uh, for instance, I have been requests from many different cities in the Mediterranean basin about how we can help the cities. About, for instance, say, we would like to understand how it's going to behave with our regional seas in the summertime, or what the hell these species are moving from one place to another. I say, could you help us? Mm -hmm. Could you? I mean, research I infrastructure. Ask if you could. And you say, yes, we can. Mm -hmm. And we can. So, and this is society, you know, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The cities are society, that's right. Just, just to mention, ICOS is working with cities in a project now, so delivering directly to the. Sorry, I don't think we should discuss the semantics. The point here is that we believe uh, that we have more to explore of the benefits of sure. infrastructure, and I think that was the point DG Mari was trying to say that it could be heard when you read the points as if we were only looking at the use for science and not mm -hmm. other uses, and she wanted to make sure that that was captured. Okay, okay. Uh, apologies if I'm now uh, no, 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 no. citing Digi Mari wrongly. It was, it, we weren't disagreeing, it was just a comment. Uh, okay, uh, right. Yeah, I That being said, also, it is feasible for industry to use. I've been working a lot with research infrastructures when I was working in industry, particularly for the regions and the SMEs, which we were uh, talking no, we're about. We're working of oceans here. We're yeah. working with type of infrastructure. Because we are not working with... They have discussed there is just an energy as well. In no, no, I'm speaking of coast biological mass, uh, etc. When ah. we're working on that, we're using... IMR's facilities, amongst others, because the industry, when it is small, cannot develop its infrastructure okay. alone, so we need dual use. Margarita, can I ask you, since we had a few minutes, you raised a point yesterday, which I think was very important, about uh, the use of infrastructures across countries and uh, shared use of it. Can you, can you say a few words on that? Would you like to? You, you can also, uh, <laughs> but, but you mean uh, uh, this morning, uh, not yesterday. Well, I was thinking about what you said concerning, uh, uh, you know, if one country offers infrastructure to another, how can we ensure that we, that they get something in return? The, the use of inside in partnership, if you have been able to call it. Uh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> This is under study. Okay, for the typology of instrument that we are, um, uh, there will be a time in less than two years from now when we will need to deploy infrastructure, research infrastructure from the very beginning. I mean, we, we have to do activities. Uh, it will be the contribution, the kind we, we uh, wrongly call it in kind contribution that countries put into these uh, uh, joint activities. So we need to ensure from one side that we deploy different typology of infrastructure because for some countries in particular, it's a really huge component of the of the effort that they can they can put on the table. Uh, from the other side, also in compliance with the um, regulation by the European Commission and the openness, we need to ensure that everyone has access to this infrastructure. At the same time, so we know that infrastructure are very costly, and infrastructure owners uh, uh, have to take into account, cannot uh, uh, share their infrastructure for free. So, um, let's say methodologies, uh, rules uh, on how to really uh, make this happening uh, are not yet very clear. And I think that another point of cooperation, maybe here we go very technical, uh, could be, because you have a lot of experience in this, because you put together uh, all facilities uh, around the European countries, uh, you also uh, have experience of former network that reported to the Commission, because we're funded by the Commission, uh, we can also study together how this will become uh, uh, really possible, because I said, we have areas of intervention, we will have more in the future, because we will reassess these thematics, where 
uh, infrastructure will be needed from the very beginning, but to make this possible, we need to uh, really design the framework, otherwise uh, we cannot deploy them. <laughs> ah, yeah, yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions?